Good morning. My name is Willie. I'm hosting this Zoom session this morning. I want to introduce our presenter. Her name is Kotsa. She's been involved with the training industry for over 20 years in theory. She's worked as a food scientist, as a quality controller, R&D manager. She has conducted over 100 training courses for more than a thousand people. So she has a lot of experience and that's the reason why we have actually also to, to host this talk for us today. So if um, everybody knows how the Zoom session works, we can carry on, but you'll see at, at the bottom of the screen, there's a microphone button that you can mute um, and um, I will unmute if you want to actually talk to us. But if it's on, there's, we do get feedback. So um, obviously there can be no other noise in the background. So sometimes the suggestion is, is to mute it and just to listen to the talk. Um, somewhere in the middle of the talk, we will take a five minute break. We will read your questions and answer some of them. And then at the end of the talk, we'll do the same thing. The talk should take about 45 minutes or so. Um, and we'll have the, the, the question and dis, um, discussions after that. Um, if it does take a little bit longer, just, just bear with us. Um, and I think that's about it. Eh? Kotsa, you want to go for it? Um, thank you. Um, um, we're talking about basic food safety, personal hygiene, um, R638, including COVID-19 prevention and control awareness. Um, good morning, everyone. I hope you are all well uh, in the current environment that we are going through. Um, we are from FoodDev. Our passion is to empower and inspire excellence. And we, we look at strategic partnerships in food business excellence. You can find more information about us on our website. FoodBev International Consulting is an accredited company uh, with FoodBev CETA. And also some of our courses are accredited with the Health Professions Council of South Africa. We are in partnership with Mitskates, uh, which offers accredited training, mostly focusing on bakery training. And also, you can find them on their, their website below. Our main focus or the training that and consulting services that we offer are mainly in the food industry, including confectionery, meat, dairy, and other commodities, including plant baking. We also focus on retailers and hospitality and catering industry. We are also training and consulting in municipalities, including Ekluleni, City of Cape Town, Nelson Mandela Bay Municipality, and also City of Johannesburg. We are also working with uh, government departments uh, in Limpopo and also Northern Cape. We have partnered with international organizations. One of the organizations is Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, which is uh, based in Switzerland and also CDC in the UK. We, part of our way involves also testing in laboratories, mainly on ISO 17025. We train on ISO 17025 and the current version is 2017. The main focus for food uh, consulting and uh, meat kits is focusing on food safety management systems, uh, some of them are oh, ISO 22000, FSSC 22000, and VRC. We also train on basic courses such as good manufacturing practices and personal, personal hygiene. We also train in management systems such as ISO 9001, the current version being 2015. And also, as I mentioned earlier on, we train on lab management systems based on ISO IEC 17025 and the medical laboratory standard, which is ISO 15189. Uh, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Besides training on the systems, we also train on the internal auditing of all systems. And we provide training on managing food integrity, which encompasses food defense, uh, where we are using TASUF as a tool, but also other tools like FDA tools, and also food fraud vulnerability assessment, where we are looking at vulnerable uh, gaps in, the, in our processes and also including the whole supply chain. Other areas that we train include Lean and 5S implementation, microbiology, food technology. And we do gap assessment audits for all systems, quality management systems and food safety mm -hmm. management systems. Today's talk we focus mainly on the basic uh, awareness, on basic food safety. Firstly, we'll talk about what is food safety. Uh, we'll talk about food safety hazards. We'll look at implications of failing to control food safety hazards. We'll also talk about how do we make food safe, communicable diseases, R638 awareness, food safety due diligence. Uh, and we'll also talk briefly about what we offer. Let's start with what, understanding what is food safety. I'm sure it's something that you are aware of, just to have an overview or a, a, a reminder. Yeah. Safety is all about assurance that food will not cause any adverse health effect for the consumer when it is prepared or consumed in accordance with its intended use. So food safety is really about giving that confidence or assurance that the food that we are manufacturing or that we are producing at the primary producer level, it is safe for consumption at the time of preparation and also at the time of consumption. Food safety, if we look at it closely, it refers to all practices and procedures that are applied in any food handling environment to control food safety hazards. So when we talk about food handling environment, these are areas that include the receiving area, areas of primary production like at the farm, processing, manufacturing, packaging, distribution, merchandising, retailing, prepare, preparation and final presentation to the consumer. So all these areas, we need to assure or to make sure that food is safe. If we look at this food chain uh, that is shown here, you will see that the potential contamination points along the food supply chain. So when we talk about farm to fork, we are talking about ensuring that food it says there's no introduction of food safety hazards at any point along this food supply chain, starting from production, via processing, distribution, retail, even at the restaurant, up to the point of consumption in the home. We should make sure that food safety hazards are controlled. So when we talk about food safety, we are saying we are looking at introduction of food safety hazards, and we are looking at where can they okay. In other words, we are saying food safety hazards can okay at any stage of the food chain. Therefore, it's very important to have adequate control throughout the food chain. Also, food safety is ensured through the combined efforts of all parties that are participating in the food chain. Everyone. In other words, we are seeing food safety is everybody's business. Everyone plays a role. So then we need to develop food safety culture in the food industry and the whole food chain. What are food safety hazards? This is just an, a review. Food safety hazards, they include biological, chemical, and radiological agents in food also include physical agents in the food with the potential to cause an adverse health effect. Examples include pathogenic bacteria, especially we are talking now about foodborne pathogens like salmonella. We're also talking about viruses, parasites. We're talking about chemicals, allergens, and also the physical agents. 
uh, or we can call them foreign bodies. We'll look briefly at all these uh, specific food safety hazards. Let's look at physical food safety hazards. These we can call them foreign bodies or foreign objects. Foreign bodies are anything that is in food, in food product that is not meant to be there. Anything that is found in a food product that is not meant to be there. These are just examples, pictures of all that is not supposed to be in our food products. Patterns, it can be jewelry, it can be screws, nuts and bolts, all this glass should not be in our food. Just a couple of examples. You can see a nut here in a finished or end product. It's not supposed to be there. That's a foreign body. That's a physical hazard, food safety hazard. You can imagine the child finding a screw in, in a cake or in a piece of um, cake. In a cake, then it, it won't look good. It, it's, it's quite terrifying, actually, to have a child coming home and say, see what I found in my cake. Also, you may find this, this is minced meat, and then there are nails in the meat. Those are all physical food safety hazards that have potential to cause harm at time of consumption. This is an epitome example of what was found during one of our training in, by one of our participants. You can actually see in this picture that there is a screw here. Apparently, the participant only noticed the screw when he was almost finishing his, his meal. And this screw it actually came off from the handle of this uh, food container. Examples of physical food safety, there are so many. We need to be able to identify all of these examples. And some of the, for example, metal may be coming from our equipment. Glass may come from various sources. So we need to be looking at all potential physical food safety hazards and try to control them. So here we just have a list of common sources of foreign bodies. For example, glass. It might be coming from light bulbs. It might be coming from glass containers and the glass food containers. Also very important, metal may be coming from splinters, may come from blades, may be coming from needles, depending on the type of processes in your plant. It may be coming from utensils. It may be coming from staples. So we look at all these potential uh, foreign bodies that may come into, for example, in the bakery industry. All these are potential physical food safety hazards and they can end up as foreign bodies that a metal detector cannot pick. So we need to be having a ways of controlling these uh, types of, of, of hazards. For example, if we have to, to control glass coming from fluorescent bulb, obviously we have to inspect the glass. Fluorescent light bulbs are examples of glass to be monitored and checked at specified intervals. And one way of controlling glass from, from light bulbs, they must be covered. So we must be monitoring to make sure that they are covered all the time. Controlling uh, food safety hazards may include prevention, detection, and removal. We need to be looking at the as first line of defense as prevention, like putting our glass covers then also must be able to detect if there's a problem. And then if we identify the problem, we need to remove as, as a way of controlling foreign bodies. There are also other typical equipment for controlling physical food safety hazards. These include filters, sieves, metal detection, magnets. We may use optical sorting equipment, x-ray detection equipment, and other uh, equipment such as graphic separation bad technology. Let's talk briefly at the food safety uh, hazards in terms of chemicals. Contamination of food with chemicals may occur through the environment. Here we are talking about the air. It could be from the soil. It can be from dust and water. That's why we talk about the having to use treated water in, the, in our plants, in our bakeries. Also, it can be 
introduction of chemicals through intentional use of chemicals. For example, during our pest control, we can introduce pesticides. Uh, also in the meat industry, when they use, when veterinary drugs are used for animals, these veterinary drugs may end up being in our end product, in meat products. Chemicals may also come from manufacturing processes and also they can come from addition food additives, additives such as food colors, pitch adjusting agents, preservatives, bleaching agents, food enzymes, glazing and polishing agents, emulsifiers, and gelling agents. This might end up being a chemical food safety additive if they are not used properly. We've got a lot of examples of chemical food safety hazards. These include even cleaning chemicals, pesticides, uh, non-food grade chemical lubricants, paint. You can think of mycotoxins coming from, if we've got problems of molds, these are secondary metabolites that can come from molds. So my, my, mycotoxins become part of chemical food safety hazards in our bakeries. Also, we must look at other uh, examples like food additives, as I mentioned earlier, on agricultural products, uh, maybe how the wheat has been grown, all this may end up in food, chemical food safety hazards. We also have uh, nitrites and nitrates. These are used as preservatives. This can also end up being chemical food safety hazards. And many others that we have listed here. For example, chlorophenols and chloranisols. These are commonly used as pesticides and herbicides, and also used as disinfectants. And if they are not used properly, they will end up being chemical food safety hazards. In the meat industry, this becomes very relevant. Veterinary drug residues and hormones, they end up being chemical food safety hazards. We spoke about mycotoxins in the baker industry. As the molds grow on our flour, they can be growing on our on our products. These some of the molds they produce mycotoxins, and these become chemical food safety hazards. Some of them can cause cancer. Another type of food safety hazard is allergenic food safety hazards. The most common food allergens are tree nuts, cashew, which are examples are cashew nuts, um, your pistachio nuts and so on, that, oh, and also pecan nuts, then also soy fish, peanuts, uh, the ground nuts, and also shellfish, eggs, the uh, wheat and the dairy products. But we've got quite a, a, a lot of these allergenic food safety hazards. Did you know, for example, sulfur dioxide is a, an allergenic food safety hazard, which is normally used as a preservative? And this needs also to be managed and to be declared labeling to indicate that we, there is an allergenic food safety hazard. Also think of cereals containing gluten, wheat, rye, barley, oats, all this is relevant in the bakery industry. These are all allergenic food safety hazards. Uh, nuts, we spoke about almonds, uh, hazelnut, walnuts, all these different types of nuts fall under allergenic food safety hazards. Eggs, all these soybeans, milk, sesame seeds, mainly used also in the baker industry. These all fall under allergenic food safety hazards that need to be declared on labels to, because there are some people who are uh, allergic, allergic reaction when they consume products containing these allergenic um, food safety hazards. <coughs> Allergen, allergy symptoms include skin allergies, uh, anaphylaxis shock or death, uh, asthma, hay fever, tongue swelling, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, wheezing, or cough and hypotension. So very important to remember that, that people may actually die from allergenic food safety hazards. So potential sources of allergen cross-contamination can include raw material handling, storage, packaging, transport. Even cross-contamination can happen through people if they move from one department to another. Or cleaning, even the use of exchanging cleaning materials or uh, cleaning equipment, very important. 
this can cause cross uh, contamination. Shared equipment, rework, management of rework, very important. Supply chain, air in manufacturing areas, so we have to be careful about the movement of air. Uh, in terms of controlling allergenic food safety hazards, processing aid, all these are potential sources of allergen cross contamination. Another important safety hazard, or which we can say most important, is the biological food safety hazard. And actually, it's an invisible when trying to control this type of a food safety hazard. Examples include Salmonella, E. coli O157. Also, we talk about Campylobacter, depending on the type of food, mainly in the bakery industry, you'll be worried about your Salmonella E. coli O157, Staphylococcus that will be coming from personnel on skin, in the throat, in the nose, from the eyes, from the ears. Uh, also, we worry about Listeria monocytogenase, Bacillus series, mainly as well in bakery industry, uh, Clostridium perfringens. Clostridium botulinum. Here we're talking about the Bacillus series and Clostridium regions, very important because these are spore formers and they can be transferred from the field into your in products. Uh, hepatitis A, norovirus, all these are just examples of very important foodborne pathogens that needs to be controlled in the food industry. There is another important aspect now the coronavirus. Severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, which we know now know SARS CoV 2. Although we know it's not a foodborne pathogen, but it's very relevant in the food industry because it can cause uh, problems in terms of infections among employees and all personnel. And this needs to be managed. <laughs> the important foodborne pathogens. Uh, organisms and food pathogenic organisms are uh, just shown here on the screen the bacteria group and the viruses and we've also included parasites various types of parasites why are we talking about this and why are we saying it's important there are effects of foodborne pathogens mainly we are worried about public health risks that are related to food safety foodborne pathogens may cause severe illness or death particularly in the vulnerable groups. These groups, we normally know them as EOPs. Why just standing for young or for old, P for pregnant, and I for immunocompromised individuals. So we are talking about the vulnerable groups, such as the young children below five years, the old people who are above 65 years old. We also worried about pregnant women, and their unborn or newly born babies. Then also on the immunocompromised individual group, we are looking at those who have other conditions that are, affect their immune systems. For example, individuals with HIV AIDS, the undernourished group. We also worry about individuals with cancer or have undergone organ transplant and immuno, those who are using immunosuppressive drugs and individuals with predisposing conditions such as diabetes mellitus and kidney disease. So these are very vulnerable groups. In normally in an, a healthy individual, perhaps these foodborne pathogens will not cause much problems, but in this group, it can actually cause severe illness and death. Common symptoms of foodborne uh, poisoning include the following vomiting, stomach cramps, diarrhea, nausea, fever, headache, muscle aches, it may also include shivering, tiredness. But these symptoms are not what happens to all these different types of organisms. They vary according to the type of organisms. Main sources of microorganisms include soil dust, and this is the primary source of microorganisms. But also we know we can get microorganisms from water, mainly used in the food environment for cleaning or as an ingredient. That's how actually some of these pathogens are introduced in our uh, bakeries, for example. Intestines of human beings and animals, they're also sources of these pathogens, food pathogens. Plant and plant products, uh, because they're in contact with the soil and water, they are very good vehicles of these foodborne pathogens. 
animals themselves and animal feeds and they hide very good sources of foodborne pathogens. And we must not forget the hands, which are the main culprit even in the problem that we have of coronavirus. So these are very good uh, vehicles for, for foodborne pathogens. Easy way of transmitting the foodborne pathogens. Other sources is the air, and this the severity now depends on the amount of dust the air contains. Then pests as well, flies, insects, rodents, the major possible carriers of foodborne pathogens, like listeria, our salmonella, uh, staphylococcus, all this can be actually carried and uh, you can actually contaminate <laughs> food via these pests. Utensils and equipment, if they are not thoroughly cleaned and if they are not properly designed, they are very good sources of microorganisms. So in other words, we are saying microorganisms are everywhere. And also we know they are very small in size. Because of the small size, they are carried in many ways, in, in, by different ways. This is why a high level of hygiene and cleaning is very important to control the spread of these microorganisms. Let's look at the importance of food safety. We are looking here at the implications of failing to control food safety hazards. What are the results of making unsafe food? Why should we make safe food? Customers do not want to be sick or die from eating unsafe food. I think that's a, a very important and relevant. No one wants to be sick after consuming food. Also, making unsafe food can result in imprisonment. If someone dies, if there's an outbreak, someone can actually go to, to, to prison uh, in some countries. And we've seen some cases here in South Africa, we are still being tried. Then also, it can result in bad press for the bakery and can actually result in bad reputation and that can actually cause brand damage. Besides that, there's loss of business and also lower profit. We always ask this question, companies can be closed. Then what happens if the company closes? You may end up on the streets. No jobs, true. Mm -hmm. You may also end up on the streets and this becomes a social and economic problem. But let's look at some cases, some real life cases of the results of making unsafe food. Uh, there's a case that happened in, in the US, a peanut corporation of America executive known as Stuart Pano got a, a groundbreaking sentence of 28 years in prison for salmonella poisoning. This case, uh, if you Google it, you, you read about it, apparently, they knew that their peanut products were contaminated with salmonella. And then that's why they actually ended up getting 28 years in prison for this salmonella poison. His brother, Michael, got 20 years. And the, the QA manager, Mary, she also got five years in prison and two years of probation. This outbreak, the salmonella outbreak, resulted in nine deaths and 714 illnesses, plus any more that were possibly not reported. An estimated of 144 million in economic losses actually occurred. After FDA investigation around 2008 and early 2009, the uh, Peanut Corporation of America was found to be the source of the outbreak. And today, as we speak, this company is permanently closed because of salmonella outbreak. That killed nine people and caused 714 illnesses. We have a similar case here in South Africa where we had one company uh, was placed as the source of hysteria monocytogenesis outbreak. And it killed quite a number of people who talk about it. And the, um, actually caused quite a number of people to be implicated in this outbreak. Prior to closing, 
in 2007, Peanut Corporation of America had grown to 90 employees and it was generating about 25 million in annual sales. You can wonder what has happened to those 90 employees. What about that revenue? So really making unsafe food can make you go out of business and you may go to jail. In 2018, this, the, the executives, they implicated three executives, they tried to appeal for their sentences and this was, caught, was thrown out of court. Uh, the, the second court actually denied uh, them, uh, the, the appeal. There's another case, case number two, that we want to talk about. In China, uh, two people were sentenced to death. They were accused of being responsible for tainting milk. They were responsible for the tainted milk scandal. I'm sure you've heard about it, the melamine milk uh, scandal in China. So these two were actually executed because the, the milk that they tainted killed at least six babies and it left many children uh, affected. They were sickened by this milk. So in some countries, they don't play. For, for example, in countries like China, in this case, mm -hmm. the individuals responsible were, were actually uh, executed. Then coming home, again in South Africa, there's a case that happened in 2014 in Johannesburg. Two primary school girls, Mbali Matlamu and the cousin Precious Msisa, together with another child, they died due to suspected food poisoning after eating food at school. This should not happen to any child if really we implicate, if we put in place measures to make sure that we produce safe food. Another case again here in South Africa happened in, in Cape Town. Two Cape Town children died after eating chicken. Uh, children six and four years old, they all died after eating a chicken. Apparently it was bought from a neighbor in Samora Machel in Cape Town. When you look at the Polon, I'm sure you know about the Polon incident in South Africa. Is our case number five. We had an issue of listeria monocytogenesis outbreak here in South Africa, which was known as the most biggest in the whole world. There were about 1,060 confirmed cases and approximately 216 deaths from January 2017 to July 2018. So how do we make food safe? We need to grow food that is safe. We need to make food in a hygienic environment, including personal hygiene, very important. We also need to establish and implement good manufacturing practices. This may vary depending on where you are. If, if it was at the farm, we'll be talking about that. Our farmers who supply us with flour, they must um, be putting in place what are known as good agricultural practices. Those who are actually growing our wheat, they must practice what is known as good agricultural practices. And ourselves as bakeries, we need to put in place good manufacturing practices. Then also we need to think about supplier quality assurance audits to make sure that our suppliers are supplying us with a product that is meeting our specification in terms of food safety and quality. Then also another step is to develop a HACCP system to the manufacture or preparation of safe food. Then also develop another food management uh, system. For example, ISO 22000, FSSC 22000 and other systems, including GFSI Global Markets Program. This is a simpler also program for small businesses which can implement GFSI Global Markets Program. This is a project that we've been working on in Zambia, where they want to make sure that food is safe that is being supplied by small businesses, small to medium scale businesses. The plan for ensuring food safety starts with the good practices here at the bottom of the pyramid. 
We need to put in place prerequisite programs. Our good manufacturing practices or good catering practices or good agricultural practices, depending on where the, the business is in the food chain. And then that's only when we can move on to implement HACCP, making sure that we've got sound prerequisite programs is the basis for our food safety system. And then have HACCP, and then we can move on to having a management system, such as ISO 22000, or we can move on to have FSSC 22000. Let's talk briefly about prerequisite programs. The prerequisite programs, these are programs and procedures and practices that are put in place to ensure that the environment is clean, sanitary and appropriate for manufacturing a safe product. So you can see proper practices. And these days, we are also talking about wearing a mask as part of controlling uh, COVID-19. But if you look at the PRPs, there are so many. This is just a general overview of PRPs include, that include cleaning and sanitizing. We are looking at construction and layout of buildings. We are looking at pest control and how we manage rework. We are also looking at waste disposal. What about utilities? The quality of the air in the work environment, water quality, and also supply energy supply that we have to ensure that we are producing a safe product, labeling and packaging, management of cross contamination, all this warehousing, very important PRP, how do we manage our end product, transportation and delivery of our products, uh, equipment suitability, cleaning and maintenance of equipment, allergen controls if we're handling any allergens, personal hygiene, very key PRPs, also purchasing and management of purchased materials. What about layout of premises and workspace? Now this is also very important in terms of COVID-19. How do we control transmission of this COVID-19 uh, or coronavirus in the workplace? This is part of risk assessment. We've got another course where we train about risk assessment for COVID-19. Then employee facilities. We talk about staff training, very important PRP. People must be competent to, to do the, the work that they are doing in terms of food safety. Then also manage, maintenance uh, of programs and buildings, recall and withdraw. All these fall under prerequisite programs that make the foundation of our food safety management system. So effective PRPs are needed to provide a solid foundation for the HACCP system and also they enable a simpler, more focused HACCP system. In other words, you don't worry about the uh, unimportant, uh, you worry, not worry about quality issues, uh, you don't worry about low hazards, you allow HACCP to focus on the process specific or product specific significant hazards. Then also, Effective PRPs help you to reduce the amount of repetition within HACCP and remove quality issues from the HACCP system. Where to find PRP requirements? You can find them in, in the South African National Standard, SANS 10.049. The current version is now 2018. The other sources where you can find all this information about PRPs is ISO 2018. If you are going for FSSC 22,000 is your management system, we also, you find PRPs in ISO TS 22,002, part one for manufacturing, but there are also other parts for different types of industry. Then other sources are BRC, uh, past 96, especially for food defense and food fraud, another area to focus on that we'll talk about later. Then also, we mustn't forget our national regulations. In South Africa, we have 638 regulations governing general hygiene requirements for food premises and the transport of uh, the transport of food. And also, we must never forget the customer requirements as part of implementing our PRPs. Let's talk briefly 
about personal hygiene. Personal cleanliness is every food handler's responsibility. It's very important to ensure that employees bath daily with the soap, change clothes and underwear daily, wear protective clothing, clean protective clothing, very important, wash hair and wear hair, net or head gear. Is also part of protecting your, your the food from especially staphylococcus from the hair and dandruff. Then also important to keep short and clean fingernails, a brush teeth at least two times every day, wash hands thoroughly, and also we do not encourage use of nail polish or on fingernails in terms of personal hygiene and making sure that the product that we are making is safe. We must also manage injuries correctly. We must cover cuts with colored waterproof bandage and also wear gloves if there are any injuries in the end. Then also why it's important we are talking about personal hygiene. It's very important in controlling COVID-19. I'm sure you've heard about emphasis on washing hands regularly and use of sanitizers regularly. So here is a main source of food poisoning microorganism. Also a problem now with coronavirus. When must hands be washed? Will it be ever sufficient to wash hands? No. So when, when must your hands, you wash your hands? After the So many. Mm. Before starting work, after breaks, after each absence from food handling area, we must wash hands. After sneezing, after coughing or blowing your nose, very important. Now even in control of COVID-19, we must wash our hands. After going to the toilet, and we now know even COVID-19, there are research that has been done that you might actually be, the, the toilet be another source of contamination in terms of COVID-19. After handling rubbish and waste, also very important. After handling chemicals, after cleaning, after touching hair or scratching your body, after smoking or taking snuff, in between handling of different products and man, uh, and at regular times during food handling, we need to wash our hands because they are very important vehicle of these foodborne pathogens. And now we are also concerned about that they are also important vehicles for COVID-19. So this, here is just an uh, illustration of steps of hand washing with the hand sanitizer, including also using hand sanitizer. Very important that we must make sure that we we using a, a, a detergent. Of course, we need to put our hands and then put the detergent and then we, uh, obviously, we need to follow the palm to palm and the, all these steps that we need to follow. We have a very good uh, source of information where you can also watch CNN. You will see this Dr. Sanjay Gupta, he always demonstrates how to wash hands. Let's talk briefly about communicable diseases, uh, also with focus with COVID-19. Food handlers known to be ill from infectious disease, uh, for example, COVID-19, or are showing symptoms of COVID-19, such as high temperature and the flu-like symptoms, they must not be allowed to come to work since they will, risk, they will pose a risk of passing the virus to other food handlers who may then infect other people. Very important. And we have realized from one of our colleagues who had this uh, infection COVID-19 uh, challenge, he actually was talking about having fever in the night. So at the workplace, we are talking about taking temperature uh, during the day. But then at night, from his experience, he was saying actually he would have high temperatures in the night. He would actually start to sweat and feel cold and hot during the night. So which is another challenge that we are facing. And we know that some people are not showing any symptoms, but they are still carrying this uh, virus. They are asymptomatic, but still uh, being infectious. There is no evidence to support that coronavirus is foodborne. However, infected food handlers 
risk infecting others throughout the food chain. That's where the concern is with uh, COVID-19. And also they'll pass this uh, to other food vendors. Mm -hmm. It could be also uh, through to distribution crew, to retail outlets, crews, and consumers in the market. And this comes home as well. And this can uh, infect children. Recently, if you listen to the news, we are hearing that he, this uh, challenge, the coronavirus, is also a challenge to children. Initially, when it started, we were thinking that it's not a major problem in children. We realize there are some challenges that are coming. They think they are showing some symptoms like Kawasaki type of uh, problems, Kawasaki type of symptoms. Uh, also important in control of uh, this communicable disease, good personal hygiene, I can't emphasize in much. And also we need to have good screening practices that need to be in place to prevent the spread of the virus in the workplace. Let's look at survival of coronavirus. Uh, in terms of our bakeries, let's think about it. How long the new coronavirus can live on surfaces? In the air, it's estimated that it's got uh, a lifespan of three hours. On copper, on money, uh, the uh, lifespan of COVID-19 is about four hours. On cardboard, 24 hours. On stainless steel, it can survive for two to three days, according to this uh, information. Probably in uh, plastic, it can last up to three days. So we do use uh, stainless steel in our, in, in our manufacturing, or propylene plastic can be, be used in the food industry. But we are saying, if this is not properly cleaned and managed, this can be a, a, a touch point where someone can actually get contaminated. And if they're not having proper practices, they might touch their face or touch their nose uh, accidentally. And we've noticed that that can happen. Uh, so this is another area to, to, to look at thorough cleaning for our equipment uh, that we use in the industry, because otherwise it may be passed from one uh, person to another. Um, let's take a break, Willie, before I go, move on to R638. Okay, and thank you guys. And as Dr. Charles is saying, I mean, if you guys need any more information, obviously there's a lot of information going around and hopefully you land up with the right information. But if you need anything like work readiness, um, cleaning schedules, like the log sheets, what is needed when you actually go back to work, what the regulations are, please let us know and we can assist. Okay. Thank you. Kortza, should we carry on? Okay, thank you, Willie. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome back, everyone. Um, okay, we want to move on to talk about R638. This is just an awareness. Uh, we've got a full course, a uh, two day course that we do on R638. So, what, uh, what is the R638 regulation? Uh, the R638 regulations is that uh, it governs uh, general hygiene requirements for food premises, the transport of food and related matters. And now this R638 replaces the R63, uh, the R962 that we used to use before. And uh, it's a new regulation that was gazetted last year in 2018. R638 is more stringent on the GMPs. In other words, it's got more demands in terms of implementing GMPs than the previous version, R962. If you look at the R638, it has 15 regulations covering the best GMPs that must be in place for anyone involved in food handling. We we'll look at the 15 regulations that govern uh, the best food uh, GMPs. So R638 includes standards and requirements for certificate of uh, acceptability, which is regulation three. Then also it talks about prohibitions on the handling and transportation of food regulation. regulation. Also requirements for food premises, uh, 
facilities on food premises, food containers, appliances and equipment, use regulation seven. And then also it talks about display storage and temperature of uh, food, uh, which is covered uh, under five keys to safer food, regulation eight. And then also protective clothing. We'll talk a bit about protective clothing as well. And also it covers duties of the person in charge, regulation 10, duties of a food handler, transportation of food, regulation 12 and 13. Let's look at regulation three, certificate of acceptability. Uh, this is a certificate given to acknowledge that food handling premises is fit for handling food upon inspection by an inspector. Normally it's an EHP, environmental health practitioner who goes and inspects these premises. A person may not handle food on premises without a valid certificate of acceptability according to the requirements. The requirement also applies to a hired vehicle used for the transport of perishable food on behalf of the person in charge of food premises. So this is a new addition to the R638, as the certification is now requiring that if vehicles transporting perishable food must have this certificate of acceptability. A person in charge of food premises wishing to get a certificate of acceptability must apply in writing to the local authority, especially they require that you write in writing you apply in writing to the local authority in whose area of jurisdiction the food premises are situated. When we talk about a person in charge, we refer to a person who is responsible for the food premises or the owner of food or food premises in the case may be. Food premises, it means a building. It means a structure, a store, or other similar structure that includes um, caravans, it includes vehicles. If you are selling food from a vehicle, it qualifies as a food premise. It, it includes stand or a place used for oral in connection with the handling of food. Let's look at the duties of the person in charge. The key change is the requirement for stricter training requirement and also qualifications need to be properly accredited. And then also assessments are conducted and very important to keep records. Uh, the keeping of records should be made available to the inspector according to the new regulations. A person in charge must be suitably qualified or otherwise adequately trained in the principles and practices of food safety and hygiene. And also the training must be accredited or conducted by inspector where applicable. Any other person working on the food premises must be suitably qualified or adequately trained again in the principles and the practices of food safety and hygiene. And this training must be done by an inspector or any other suitable person. In other words, if they come to inspect and to look at the documents, we must provide evidence that the training was done by an inspector or any other suitable person. Again, routine assessments are conducted to determine the impact of the training required. Very important for records, we need to keep our training programs, we must have training programs, records must be kept up to date and must be available to an inspector on request. For example, your certificates, uh, certificate of acceptability, your certificates of qualifications and also attendance register. These are just examples of records that needs to be kept at the premise. Other duties of the person in charge, they include that the person in charge must ensure that there is an effective pest control program and other programs that are needed include the waste disposal program, there must be an effective cleaning and disinfection program, 
And also there must be a good housekeeping program. These are very important housekeeping program of the premises and the vehicles that are used to transport the food. Another area to look at is that all personnel working in the food handling premises, they need to adhere to a code of conduct that is in line with the good manufacturing practices. Any area where food is handled or stored is not used for sleeping, very important. And also that area for handling food should not be used for washing or laundering clothes or any other purpose that may contaminate food. But here we also want to emphasize that for all these programs, you need to keep records. In other words, records, records, they are very important for all these programs as proof of implementation of these programs. Regulation 11, it talks about the requirements of duties of a food handler. Here we are talking about uh, at, uh, the food, a facility or a container must not be handled by a person whose hands or clothes uh, that are not clean. In other words, they must always wash hands, frequently washing hands. And also the fingernails must be short, must be trimmed, must be clean, and free from any jewelry. Or we can call that adornment according to the regulation, but talking about all that, anything that we may wear in our fingers, uh, like jewelry. <clears throat> Who has not washed his or her hands thoroughly with soap or with water or cleaned them in another effective way? In other words, the never touching or handling food without washing hands with the soap or other means that is effective for removing uh, contaminants. Regulation 8 talks about five keys to safer food. These include keep clean, separate raw and cooked food, cook thoroughly, keep food at safe temperatures, and also use safe water and raw materials. All these are ways of making sure that food is not contaminated. This, we also train them as World Health Organization, five keys to safer food. Let's look at uh, Regulation 9, Standards and Requirements for Protective Clothing. Here, we just want to focus mainly on, on gloves, as we have seen that uh, there's a time when everyone was wearing gloves, uh, even uh, <coughs> in public. Gloves are good at providing protection against COVID-19. However, there's a problem. We need to make sure that the hands are washed properly. And uh, we need to follow proper hand washing procedures while wearing gloves. Make sure that it's effective to control the, the virus. Also, we must remember that microorganisms, including foodborne pathogens and also this coronavirus, will stay on the gloves when one touches contaminated surfaces. Maybe they may touch the high touch points, like doors, they may touch high touch points like surfaces that are regular touched by other people. So it's very important to make sure that we know that gloves will carry these pathogens, including even coronavirus. So improper use and abuse of gloves can lead to self-contamination and self-infection. You can see, for example, someone eating chips wearing gloves. That's leading to self-infection. Also, once a child was seen eating ice cream, while wearing gloves. That's really a use of gloves and that can lead to self-infection. So in food industry, we generally discourage the use of gloves unless it is absolutely necessary. For example, if you are working with ready-to-eat foods and also personnel have to be properly trained and monitored, otherwise gloves would be a source of contamination. There was a huge glove controversy in the industry for a while, whether to wear gloves or not to wear gloves. But if we have to wear gloves, it means we need to manage them properly. Also very important, washing hands with soap or sanitizing hands frequently. And also whenever one makes contact with the potentially contaminated services or objects, 
it is highly encouraged to continuously wash our hands. During this COVID outbreak, it is advisable to use publicly available sanitizers frequently if we are in public, and also as well, we must use our we must have our own personal sanitizers in our pockets or our, our handbags to sanitize our hands even when you are wearing gloves. So we must remember that wearing gloves does not replace proper hand hygiene. So we must always sanitize the gloved hands to avoid contaminating ourselves. So always washing our hands and also remember that with the gloves we can we can actually touch the touch points where everyone is touching. And if we are not careful, we may touch our face, we may poke our nose, we may answer our cell phones, and then we might actually end up self-infecting ourselves. Also, when we want to remove gloves, they must be removed properly away from you, making sure that you are not uh, contaminating yourself. Let's talk about masks, very important as well. Uh, you no, know, there was a debate on the use of masks, but now the debate is over. Everyone is to wear a mask in public places. We've seen that also uh, it's a requirement or recommendation in America. Uh, here in South Africa, it's a requirement. It's, it's, it has been, it, it, it's a law now to, to wear uh, masks in public. It needs to be enforced. Why? To make sure that um, we do not uh, infect other people. It's about protecting the other person when we are wearing the mask. Um, very important. Concern on the improper use of and abuse of masks is actually the major problem during this high transmission period of the disease as people are trying to protect themselves. If we do not handle these masks properly, if we do not use them properly, that's a very much concern in terms of transmission of the virus. If we look at the statistics as of today, I was looking at the statistics. RSA uh, South Africa is 12,000 confirmed cases, 219 days, and so far about 4,745 people have, have, have recovered. In the US, the situation doesn't look good. As of today, there's about 85,000 deaths in the USA. Total confirmed cases are standing at 1.4 million. If we look at the global situation as of today, we are standing at about 4.4 million uh, confirmed cases and at about 198 deaths, almost 299,000 deaths uh, globally. And here, uh, we're just talking about issues of how, how controlling COVID-19 and also looking at the mask is another way that it has been introduced as a control measure in terms of not passing the infection to the next person and considering every person is asymptomatic, the potential to, to pass on the virus to others. So this is something that needs to be enforced in the workplace to make sure that there's no transmission of the virus within the workplace. So when we look at wearing of masks, this is the correct way. Everyone needs to understand the purpose of wearing a mask and we must always wear it this way, the correct way, where we are covering the nose and covering the mouth. Um, bottom of the chin must be covered. Also the bridge of the nose. This is the proper way to, wear, to, to have the mask. We've put some slides here where we talk about how to wear the mask. Very important to understand the orientation or the top side of the mask, especially with those masks with the metal strip. The top side with the metal strip is the top part of the mask. Ensure the proper side of the mask also faces outwards because normally the mask might have two colors. You must know which one is this, the out, outside and which one is inside of the mask. Place the mask to your face covering the nose, mouth, and chin. And also, if, if the mask has got a metal strip, you must pinch the metal strip or stiff edge of the mask so it molds to the shape of your nose to make sure that there's no entry 
or a exit of the uh, droplets coming from your nose. After use, also put on the mask bottom so that it covers your mouth and the chin. After use, when you take off the mask, first remove the elastic loops from behind the ears. We see some people, they are taking the mask from the front. That should be avoided. You must be removing from your ears. Very important. Uh, and you, you must remove in such a way that you don't contaminate yourself. After use, when you take off the mask, so you must remove from the back and also discard the mask in a closed bin. But now we are talking of maybe in the uh, factory we are using uh, cloth masks because the surgical masks are now to be used by the uh, uh, frontline personnel. So now we're talking about using uh, cloth masks. We must also be able to manage the cloth masks. When we remove them, make sure that they are properly stored or washed and obviously must be uh, disinfected and also must be ironed or put in the sun, sun to dry. Do's and don'ts of masks. What to do with masks? We must follow proper hand washing procedures before we put on the mask. We must always wash our hands before we put on the mask. And then also, before we put on the mask, we must inspect for any tears. And also then we must remember to make sure we are covering the nose, the mouth, and the, and the chin. What not to do with masks? is never to put the mask without washing our hands and also do not touch anything or anyone after discarding a mask. First, you must sanitize your hands uh, to remove any contaminants. Also, do not touch the mask unnecessarily, especially with unclean or unsanitized hands or gloves. Very important. What to do with masks? You must replace the mask with a new one as soon as it is damp. Do not continue to use a damp mask. Also remove the mask from behind as we discussed without touching the front part and discard immediately in a closed bin. Or we must clean hands with alcohol-based uh, sanitizer. Normally it must be more than 60% uh, sanitizer. Do not use a mask more than once or once it's damp, we must discard it. And also, uh, do not leave nose, mouth, or chin uncovered. I think you've seen this even on TV. Normally, people are having interviews, either they are not covering their nose or they put the mask in their necks. We should never do that. Otherwise, it won't save the purpose of uh, protecting others from infection. So oh, this is the wrong way of wearing the mask, leaving the nose. That's the wrong way of wearing a mask. It may be also really under the chin. All this must be discouraged in the workplace. We must ensure people are wearing masks correctly. So when we're talking about COVID-19 control, it's more about common sense. Uh, so one of our colleagues always wants to talk about that. I wish common sense was more common. But if you look at COVID-19, yeah. yes, so, so it's about hygiene. We always do that. Wash our hands in the factory. We must always continuously do that regularly. We have discussed that. It's about hand hygiene, very important. And also coughing, sneezing, etiquette. We need to know we we to have proper etiquette, coughing, sneezing, and talking etiquette. Not talking too much. That's another way of uh, actually spreading the virus. Uh, cough or sneeze in a mask, or we can cough and sneeze in a in a bent elbow. But also we can see there could be some allergies. That's why it's important to be wearing our mask. Then another uh, behavior is social distancing and also looking at ventilation and air circulation in where we are working. Charles will talk more about this, he's passionate about this area, if anyone has questions. 
Another way to reduce uh, transmission in the workplace, we need to look at the, uh, how our employees are being moved from, uh, uh, how are they commuting to work, how are they traveling from home to work, because this is a very easy, there's no social distancing here. Also, maybe another safety concern here. What we can also do in the workplace is to encourage or to put in place signs and posters uh, for people to be aware to make COVID-19 visible in the workplace. Uh, these are all ways of making COVID-19 awareness uh, more visible in the workplace. Or you can also use a food operated sanitizing station, very important in the workplace. And obviously, you must look at sanitizing all touch points, all strategic points, they need to be sanitized. Now, for example, these are examples. We can look at the bakery and look at which ones are the high touch points where people regularly touch and we need to make sure that they are regularly sanitized. Mm. Okay. So all these are just examples. What about the, the pay point? Very high, one of the major culprits in terms of uh, areas where there's high touch uh, will be the all different people. So that needs also to be sanitized when we're looking at, when we go to the supermarket, we need also to just be aware and make sure that we sanitize our hands after leaving the, the supermarket. Okay, I want to talk briefly, I'm almost finishing. I just want us to talk briefly about approach to food fraud prevention. But I want us to look at the umbrella for food safety management system. We have food safety here, where we talk about prevention of unintentional or prevention of accidental adulteration. Yeah, whenever there's this unintentional or accidental introduction of food safety hazard, as we mentioned earlier on, real, the tool that controls these unintentional hazards is acid. And this is science-based uh, and controls mainly for bone illnesses. But we've got another pillar under our umbrella. We have food defense where we can talk about task threat assessment, critical control points, where we're looking at threats and prevention of intentional adulteration. Here we're looking at behavioral or ideologically motivated adulteration. Normally this is done by individuals who want to cause malicious harm to your business. Mm, so yes. it's another pillar that we need to pay attention to. <clears throat> Then another pillar is the food fraud, uh, where we talk about vulnerability assessment, critical control uh, point, or where we, we come up with a plan for, for food fraud plan to where we are looking at prevention of intentional adulteration. But here, the intention is for economic gain. So the person is motivated by making a profit or to, to have economic gain. Yet they may cause um, maybe adulteration of products or raw materials for economic gain. So these are the three pillars that we talk about. And these are three pillars also when we are implementing FSSC 22,000. Now I'll talk briefly about food safety due diligence. What we are saying, even when we are looking at these three pillars, we must put in place systems that help us to control uh, hazards and threats and vulnerabilities. Food safety due diligence is taking reasonable effective precautions to ensure safe food. So how do we do that? By identifying all food safety critical stages of food production, processing, storage, and distribution. And then also identifying suitable control measures to adequately prevent the risk of food safety failures. And then we put in place appropriate management control procedures. Then we, <coughs> for us, in terms of food safety, to control unintentional food safety hazards, we use HASU as a tool for due diligence. 
as I mentioned earlier on, to control intentional adulteration for economic gain, we have to put in place a food fraud plan of uh, where we do a vulnerability assessment uh, and put in place a plan to control intentional adulteration. To control intentional malicious contamination of food, we use a food defense plan and we use a tool known as TASO, um, which is a threat assessment critical control point. But there are other tools that can be used, such as the FDA uh, a food defense plan. Okay, so I'm coming <coughs> to the end of my presentation. Delivering food safety is not what you know. It's not what you say. It's what you do. Also very important, we need to develop a food safety culture. Thank you. Here are some of our clients that we have uh, been assisting with the training and consulting <coughs> uh, with the different systems, include, including food defense and food fraud training. And also, this is what we offer as Food Beef International Consulting and meets in partnership <coughs> to offer accredited food safety skills programs, food safety training and consulting. We have also started online training uh, successfully and also assisted in CETA grant funding uh, and WSP and learnerships. These are our contact details. Thank you, Willie. Thank you, Nkota, for that very um, well-informed presentation. And hopefully everybody has learned a little bit more than what they knew when, before they started watching this presentation and listening to you. I don't know what the rest of the participants feel like. Ludwig, what do you think? Yeah, it, it was good. Okay, you enjoyed it? Did you learn something yeah. from it? Yes, a lot. A okay, lot. good. One thing I must say is besides the food safety culture, I think it's also a personal uh, safety culture that we actually need to adopt going forward. And obviously, if we are personally uh, keep ourselves safe, we will automatically do the same with the food. Um, but yes. Uh, who else is um, still with us? Karabu? Hello, yes, sir. Uh, did you find the presentation? It was very useful, sir. Thank you. Okay, did you learn something from it? Yes, sir. Definitely. Okay, okay. no, that's good. At, at least we, we know that we're doing something right, hopefully. And uh, like we say, if you really, really need any more information, the, the details are over there. And we are more than willing to actually help and assist wherever we can. Like Dr. Joel says, Thank there's you. lots of other stuff that they're doing. And Kurtz has also said they've now started a whole lot of online training. Um, so feel free to, to contact, contact us anytime you want some more information and help. Thank you so much. No problem at all. And uh, hopefully you guys can get back to work soon. And with your pineapples. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good business, I think, in all fairness. But obviously, there's lots of. Um, I'm sure most of your stuff is still manual, eh? You're not automatic. Uh, you're not automatic. Yeah, we yeah we're doing everything manual at the moment. It's like hard work. <laughs> yeah. So therefore, personal hygiene is very, 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 very important. Obviously. And obviously yeah. you're dealing with something um, that is acidic. So already there's a lot of acid and everything else involved with those products. So you really need to make sure that your, your facilities and, and the staff are 100% trained and uh, know what's actually happening. But like we said, if you need the, the guidance for what is required from the law when it comes to cleaning, we're more than willing to, to help you with that. The cleaning procedures, all of those things. So just let us know. Okay, thanks, Uli. Okay. Uh, who else is there with us? 
still. Uh, I see we've still got a couple of people on mute, but I don't think they're still there. Um, yeah, there's Mashad, Mashad Sen. Mashad yeah. Sen, yeah, but I think they're yeah. still on mute there. Yeah, Mashad Sen has actually attended one of our courses. So, oh, okay, yeah, so we continue to interact with him, which is great. Uh, awesome. Okay. And uh, Rafila Weir was also there. Yes, yes William is still here. Ah, okay, now go. Cool. All right, now <laughs> we're just talking about the Easter Wall, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, well, all I can say is thank you to everybody that's taken the time to actually listen to this presentation. Thank you, Kutsa, for giving up your time to, to do the presentation for us. We really <coughs> do appreciate what you do. And thank you, Dr. Charles, as sure. well. And uh, yes, thanks to everybody. Like I say, you've got our details there. Give us a shout if you need any help. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. Thank you, Kotsa. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. We'll chat soon. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, then. Thank you. Unless if there are any questions, otherwise we can call it a day. Um, I have a question. Sure. Yes. I wanna. I, I I want to find out what how do we distinguish between the regulation three six eight and good manufacturing practices? Okay. Uh, first, uh, the regulation is law, isn't it? It's required by law. You have to do it. Mm. And when we look at the GMP, it's coming from what from a standard, for example. And then that's a, a standard. It's something that you want to put in place, but it's not required by law. They are just the requirements to make sure you produce a safe product. So in other words, it's, it's a requirements that you must fulfill for you to be recognized as a company that is producing a safe product. Mm -hmm. So even the regulations there, they've also indicated what is must be that is what is record, regulated, what must be in place uh, and is required by law that you must actually do it, actually implement it. Uh, the, just to carry on with that one, uh, GMPs is basically a guideline and it's broad based. So you have GMPs for, for different sectors of, of the market. For argument's sake, in the bakery, you would have GMPs and you would obviously focus on, on what you would want the staff to do and what you want the company to do. So these guidelines, and it is something that is taught. Um, there is a unit standard from from CETA and it's a accredited course as well. And so there you basically, all that you're doing is you're teaching people how to actually handle things correctly. And as okay. what I said, the, the regulation is the regulation and it obviously depends. So there's no guidelines there. That is what you must do. It's not that mm -hmm. you have a choice mm -hmm. about what you want to actually do. So hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank you, Mr. Willy. No problem. Anything else from you guys? No more questions? Everybody shy? Okay, of course, I think there's no more questions. I'm not sure. Uh, but if you guys want to answer, uh, ask us questions separately or want to email us questions, we can also answer questions via email as well. It's not a problem. Mm. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Kota. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Chat soon, Kota. Thanks, guys. Thanks okay. for attending. Thank you.